Good day everyone and welcome back to the fourth video in this series on wall model DLS. Last time we looked in detail at how the wall shear stress pops up as a relevant quantity for our wall model to predict. And now it's time to actually look at the wall models themselves and we are going to focus on RAND's wall stress models. So let's start with these two pictures which should be quite familiar by now. So on the left we have our wall stress modeling hierarchy and as I said we're going to focus on the RAND based branch and here we see that it divides into PDE, ODE and algebraic wall stress models and in this video we're going to cover the PDE and the ODE ones starting with the PDEs, okay? And uh, algebraic is going to be for the next video. On the right we also have a familiar picture and this basically depicts how a wall stress model works. So in the last video we looked a lot at how this quantity pops up, now it's finally time to look at what's in the box. Uh, but uh, also this stage is also important, right? So we, the fundamental thing is that for us to get any kind of prediction of tau wall we need some information regarding the solution to our LES equations at some point in the domain. And the point of the domain is usually at some relatively close distance to the wall since we're predicting a wall quantity and the distance from the wall to the sampling point is going to be h. Uh, and this is going to happen at each face, right? So for each face we're going to define a sampling point. So as the name implies, RANS-based wall models are based on RANS equations. And we're going to start with the most complicated ones which are the PDE models. This figure, which I took from Park and Moyne, a paper in the Journal of Computational Physics, really illustrates very well how a PDE-based wall model works. Uh, they, in turn, adapted it from uh, Boddert and Larson uh, from this uh, CTR annual research brief from 2011. So what we see here on the left is the LES domain, as it should in wall stress modeling. It stretches all the way down to the wall, right? So an R grid is somehow adapted to the outer link scale of the turbulent boundary layer delta, which is also depicted very nicely here. Now, the way a PDE-based RANS model works is that you solve the full RANS equations on a separate grid, right? So you actually construct a separate grid for the same geometry spanning between the wall and this distance h for each wall face. Uh, now, since this is a RANS grid, what we need to do is adapt it in terms of a wall normal uh, cell size. So at the wall, it should be uh, of order one with respect to the inner, inner scales, so y plus one. Uh, but on the other hand, in the wall parallel direction, we don't really need to worry about it that much. So on that, we save quite a lot of resources. So the way this is coupled is that the LES solution is sampled along this line and serves as a boundary condition, okay? So let's pretend that this, this, this line in the LES domain is the same as this red line, so that at each time step we sample the solution along this line and then it serves as a boundary condition on this top boundary for the RANS equations. And then we solve the RANS equations. So given the solution of the RANS equations, we get the prediction of the wall shear stress and we plug it back in into the LES solution. Uh, in principle, one can use any RANS model here. You can use your K omega or whatever, but in practice, in all the lit literature, uh, simple 1D mixing length type of RANS models are used. Okay. A very important subtle point is that we don't actually solve the pressure equation for the RANS equations. Uh, instead, we simply assume that the uh, wall normal gradient of pressure is zero. If you recall, we already discussed it in this previous video that that's a reasonable assumption for the inner layer. So here it's used to its full extent, so to speak. So we simply sample the pressure gradient at the red line and provide it as a boundary condition. And therefore, the only thing we need to solve is the momentum equation. This, of course, uh, reduces drastically the computational expenses of a wall model, which is very important. At this point, we arrive to a fundamental issue with all types of turbulence modeling methods, which somehow couple LES and RANS. And that is how to deal in the region where the two sort of touch on each other or collapse. Uh, so with respect to this PDE-based wall stress models, 
The issue is that if we sample the LAS solution and provide it as a boundary condition, then of course the values we get here at the boundary are going to change from time step to time step. This is going to be a transient signal which we're going to send as a boundary condition to the RANS solver. What this will result in is that you are going to start getting some transient motions, some resolved eddies in your RANS solution. And this is bad because in principle, here the turbulence model should account for all the turbulence, right? So what happens is that you get the contribution of a turbulence model, but you also have the contribution of these resolved eddies. So in total, it becomes too large. Um, so as I said, this issue that you get some kind of mess where you couple the two regimes together, you find it everywhere. So if you look at, uh, <clears throat> if you look at seamless um, hybrid LES RANS models like DES, then you have this famous uh, gray zone where your solution is not quite RANS, not quite LES, but something in between, right? If you instead look at a zonal um, hybrid LES RANS method, then you, it seems like you avoid that, right? So you define explicitly here it's RANS, here it's LES, but then the problem is that, again, it's sort of like here that uh, the LES brings a transient solution to the uh, upper boundary of the RANS. And then on the other hand, the RANS sort of dampens the LES. Uh, so what people have been doing is trying to introduce um, some extra synthetic fluctuations at the interface between the LES and RANS to try to mitigate this problem. So it seems like whatever method you use, you're still, it's, this issue is still going to manifest itself in one way or another, and you will have to figure out how you want to deal with it. So for, for the, the case of PDE-based wall stress models, there have several solutions have been introduced in the literature through the year, uh, through the years, sorry. Um, I'm not going to go into detail regarding any of them. Basically, all of them work with a turbulence model that you employ in the RANS, and uh, you dampen its effect a little bit um, in order to account for the resolved uh, eddies. Another solution has been to, well, simply average out the input you get here so that, in fact, your signal becomes uh, stationary. If you want to learn more about this and uh, the proposed solution, so here's some literature that it's free papers. Um, so two of them from the Stanford group, uh, but Wang and Moy in 2002, and then Park and Moy in 2014. And then there's also one by Kawai and Larson uh, from 2012. So at this point, let us just write out the RANS equations so we have them in place, uh, look at them a little bit and say, okay, this, these, these are the equations that the wall model is going to solve. Uh, because then later we're going to start from these equations to derive simpler models like the ODE models. But before we do that, uh, let's just recap the pros and cons of the PDE approach. So the ultimate pro is that in principle, you, ca you capture all the terms in the Rance equations, right? So you capture the pressure gradient effect, you capture the acceleration, everything is perfectly in place. You don't really make any assumptions about the behavior of a fluid near the wall as you do in other models. So this is very good. You can in principle capture any state of a TBL. Right? As long as your RANS model supports it, you're good. So that's a pro. And then the cons, one is that it's fairly difficult to implement. You can imagine that, for example, in, well, not only do you need two solvers, right? LES and RANS, that's probably not such a big deal. But this you also have to think about that you have these two grids. So for example, in a very parallel setting, you have to figure out the communication between the LES and RANS that it scales well with the amount of cores, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's quite a lot of sub subtleties. And I'm going to link to a paper which actually discusses them in great detail. The second problem is that it's actually quite expensive. Uh, what, what one may note is that since you're doing RANS, you're adapting your uh, grid to the inner scales. Uh, in only one direction, in the wall normal one, but still you have to do that. So uh, that means that you do indeed get some sort of scaling with, uh, with Reynolds Tau, which is not ideal because the whole point was to avoid it. Uh, of course, it's much less than if you would do an LES, but still it's there. 
And uh, for example, if we look at this paper by Park and Moyn in uh, JCP 2016, then what they say is the ratio of the number of cells in the wall model to the number of cells in the LES is about 0.2 to 0.5. So that's quite a lot. Of course, that's dependent on the problem. I think this referred to a um, bluff body problem, like a flow around an airfoil. I, I may be mistaken here, but I mean, obviously this is d dependent on how the how the domain looks, right? But but the point is that PDE models are by far the mo most expensive ones uh, in the three classes we're going to look at. And finally, a uh, quite important practical concern is this second grid, right? So who's gonna provide that second grid? Either you have to tell the uh, CFD engineer or whoever's going to use your model that, look, okay, you, this is your wall model LES grid, but you also have to sort of carve out this thin domain near the wall and create a grid for that. Uh, and then of course, I mean, you get all sort of complexity, complexities in case setup, etc. So that is quite a bit of a problem because already meshing is usually, you know, the bottleneck for CFD engineers and definitely they don't wanna have the hassle of having to construct a second grid. In principle, maybe one can automate it, but uh, that's also difficult but maybe overcomable with sufficient programming effort. But then we're coming back to this difficult to implement issue. Okay, so now some literature on PDE models. The first paper has already been discussed, this Wang and Moin from 2002. I've talked about it with respect to the solution uh, to the issue of uh, resolved eddies in the RAS region, but uh, it's generally a good paper showing the performance of a full PDE model. And I believe they do compare with um, ODE models as well, if I recall correctly. Uh, the second one, already also already mentioned, Park and Moy in 2016, uh, focuses on the implementation of a, of a PDE law stress model in an LES code for unstructured meshes. So this can be read in order to appreciate how you know complex it is to implement such a thing, what things one had to think about. They also provide some benchmarks uh, in terms of computational complexity. Um, how long time it takes uh, compared to a baseline case with no wall model, etc. So it's a it's a nice read. Then we have this paper by Park, um, and here he considers I think it's flow uh, around one of those humps. There are many humps uh, one deals uh, with in order to test flows of separation, uh, hills, humps, whatever. Uh, so this is one of them. Uh, and the good thing about this paper is that he distinctly compares the uh, results with a simple model, uh, I think it's an ODE model, and uh, this full PDE model. And then finally we have uh, the paper by Calafel and colleagues uh, from a completely different uh, group. So this is from Barcelona, and they have also implemented their own model, um, which they discuss here, and uh, they are the ones that uh, did this uh, timer averaging of um, uh, input you get from the LES to get rid of um, uh, resolved eddies. So also a nice paper to read on PDE models. And by the way, this question of, so is it actually worth it in terms of uh, accuracy to get an, to, to use a PDE model compared to a simpler one? I would say it's it's still open. So um, I, I cannot say for sure because I don't think anyone can say for sure at this point. Uh, but I encourage you basically to uh, look at the results, for instance, in this 2017 and 2002 papers and uh, yeah, form your own opinion. Uh, what do you think? Is the increase in accuracy worth compared to the hassle you have to go through to get this model to work? All right, so the idea was that we are going to cover ODE models in this video as well. But then I looked at the time as I was recording the ODE parts and then I saw, okay, we're already at 20 minutes and not, not even halfway through. Uh, so I've decided to cut it here actually and uh, we're going to start with ODE models instead in the next video and uh, keep these time limits relatively reasonable. I don't want to have videos more than 20 minutes. I think it's uh, can become a little bit hard to digest. Uh, so thanks for watching this one and uh, stay tuned for the next one. If you want to make sure you don't want to miss it, you can click that subscribe button and uh, until next time.